co-director uh, Joseli Mainers is not here. She's in here in spirit. And we're very, very happy to uh, have our two guest speakers for this uh, exciting webinar. I think that the topic is uh, of interest for all of us. And before we start, let me just say that uh, we in Techs are continuing to work to expand and promote good practices for uh, heritage education in the area of Spanish. And of course, sharing uh, all our materials, that's our main focus. So after the webinar is done, we normally will uh, edit the video and then the report will be posted in our website. So um, who is our community moderator, will help us today and he will post uh, our uh, link. So you can visit our website if the first time you are joining uh, a text event. Also, I mean, we're very excited this year, our summer workshop in San Antonio. Uh, UT San Antonio is hosting the next um, summer workshop for techs and we hope that you can join us over there. In the link also, you will see um, the you can see more information and register if you can. It's going to be on June 1st and 2nd. And we're very excited about going to San Antonio because all our workshops before were in, in Austin. Okay. Start, entonces, uh, please let me introduce our two great um, speakers. First is Dr. Lili Padilla, who is currently an assistant professor of Spanish at Houston. Sam Houston State University. She obtained her PhD and master in Spanish linguistic at Arizona State University and her bachelor's degree from the University of Ghana. She also holds a diploma uh, in Spanish from the University of Cienfuegos in Cuba. Her research interests include Spanish language variation in Guinea Equatorial, Afro-Latin representations, critical discourse analysis, and Spanish heritage language pedagogy. Is the co-editor of the forthcoming volume, uh, Representation, Inclusion, and Social Justice in World Language Teaching, Research and Pedagogy for Inclusive Classroom, and this was published by Rutledge. Her work has also been published in several journals, including the International Journal of Bilingualism, Language Awareness, Journal of Language, Identity and Education, Journal of Monolingual and Bilingual Speech, and the Mountain Journal. She also has a number and cover book chapters appearing in different volumes. Then uh, Dr. Ross Divana is also assistant professor of Spanish linguistic and faculty director of study abroad programs in the Department of World Languages and Cultures. At oh, I talked to Zoom, Zoom mom. So, uh, can you please uh, mute your <laughs> microphones, everyone? Thank you. His research, a rusty research interest include linguistic representations and inclusion in language uh, context. So she's, so you guys have- Spanish makes the heritage in second language classes, language attitudes and ideologies. His work is published in different journals, such as the Critical Inquiry and Language Studies, Language Awareness, Journal of Language Education. And he's currently also in, uh, in the same uh, volume uh, with, with uh, Lily. Uh, that is a uh, title, uh, Representation, Inclusion, and Social Justice in World Language Teaching, Research and Pedagogy for Inclusive Classroom. So please, let's welcome our speakers. And we will basically run the webinar for about 30, 35 minutes, and they will have some uh, time for discussion and questions. Thank you so much, Claudia, for introducing us. And thank you to everyone who is here today for making it. Um, today we are going to present on Afro Latinx and Spanish language textbooks. And we are grateful to everyone who is here today to, to take part in this presentation. So despite the technological advances, language textbooks are still very important in our language teaching and in the language classrooms. Textbooks form the core of many foreign language classes. They represent the target language speakers and cultures. Um, many textbooks have now gone beyond teaching about grammar and uh, communication. These days, many textbooks have teach about, about intercultural competency skills. So textbooks are very important in our classrooms. 
However, research has found that these textbooks do not contain neutral information or facts in spite of their importance. Um, previous studies have shown that textbooks contain, um, uh, textbooks are able to discriminate against social classes, gender, and race. And because of this, that has been found in textbook, it's important to examine the representation of minority groups. And in this study, and this presentation, we are looking at Afro-Latinx in Spanish language textbooks. It's important to speak out and challenge the ideologies that value marginalized groups, especially those ideologies that promote the need interests of the dominant groups or classes at the expense of the marginalized groups, using the self-representation misrepresentation of these non-dominant groups. So in this presentation, we are going to at Latinx education and world language teaching. We will look at Afro Latinx representation in textbooks. We will look at the resources for educators to self-educate. We would also look at some pedagogical strategies that we can use in the classroom. For instance, um, paying attention to history, looking at diverse voices, personal reflections, linguistics. Then we have a discussion and then a conclusion. So now we've been mentioned Afro-Latinx. So who are Afro-Latinx? The term Afro itself, it, indi it uh, indicates origins from Africa or African ancestry. However, the term Latinx refers to a person of Latin American origin. According to Flores and Roman, um, the term Afro-Latinx, when you put both of them together, it meant as a way to respond to this group's invisibility. It's a way to signal that um, the cultural and social diversity amongst Latinx. Hodgman and Freeman, Hod and, Freeman and Vera describe Afro Latinx as people of visible or self identified African heritage who trace their heritage to Spanish or Portuguese speaking Latin America. And when we talk about Afro Latinx, it's not just a darker skin complexion when compared to Afro Latinx, it's an identity that is formed by how one chooses to trace one's meaning. So when we look at Afro-Latinx in the US, the Pew Research Center has found that there are 6 million people in the US who identify as Afro-Latinx. Afro-Latinx are about 2% of US adult population and 12% of all Afro-Latinx. Almost one in seven do not identify as Afro-Latinx. When we look at this image, we can see um, the percentages of Afro-Latinx that we have in different countries. We see that Brazil has the largest population of Afro descendants now. In Cuba, we have about 35%. Um, in the, the Dominican Republic, we have a huge number. In Colombia, 10.5% as well. The term Afro Latinx is used mainly in the US, but in Latin American countries, we have different terms used for Afro descendants. They could go by Blanco, Negro, Mulato, Negra, different terms are used. And we have many Afro-Latinx in the Caribbean and Brazil. So now let's look at Afro-Latinx and world language education. Very few studies have looked at the representation of Afro-Latinx in educational curricula. Um, the few studies that have looked at Afro-Latinx have found that textbooks specifically continue to marginalize and erase Afro-Latinx in these books. So erasure and anti-Blackness are big into the geographical and common demographic concepts of Latin America. It's very common to find it reinforced in school curricula due to the fact that there's no comprehensive information about Latinx people or history and cultures in many of these educational curricula that we have today. And so now Rusty is going to talk about Afro-Latinx representation in L2 and SHL textbook. It's a study that we have conducted. I'm sorry, I'm unmuted. Um, so this part of the presentation will be quick only because we would like to devo devote majority of our presentation more to the pedagogical implications and how to implement some things in the classroom to bring awareness. So we'll, I'm going to go over two quick studies that Lily, Lily and I conducted. First, we looked at L2 textbooks. And this slide here shows the textbooks that we um, analyzed. In total, there were 12 textbooks. 
that we looked at. So the next following slides will focus on some of the data that we found. So specifically, the number of textual representations of Afro-Latinx. When referring to re uh, textual representations, we're talking about anywhere in these textbooks where it said they're, you know, Afro-Latinx or they're Garifuna or they're individuals of, you know, Descendencia Africana. So we did not base this based solely on the photos, but it had to be a textual representation referring to an Afro-Latinx. So as you see, the number of textual representations in all the books was 52. Textual representation of all other Latinx, 2,263, and total 2,315. Um, with visuals, with clear reference to Afro-Latinx, we see the number is very low. In total, there was 22 or about 10%. And in total of all pictures of people, there was 2,593. So we see that this marginalization and this erasure of the Afro-Latinx is quite common in these textbooks. And we, uh, Lily and I would just like to say that we understand that many of times the publisher also is, you know, telling the authors what to include and how to write it and how to cite it but it just shows that there needs to be more representation of Afro and other minorities with regard to the Hispanophone world. Next, focusing on Spanish as a heritage language textbooks, we analyzed seven. And as we all know, in this field, textbooks are slowly being, you know, not used as much. Some are out of print, not being published, and more individuals are using OER, so Open Educational Resources. So as you see, the textbooks we analyzed range from 1999 all the way to 2020. And looking at the erasure in text, we found that there was only 38 total number of representations, right? With the highest number being in Si Se Puede, La Lengua Que Heredamos, and Conversaciones Escritas, and as well as Galeria Uno. And when looking at the total number of visual images, we see that the numbers as well are quite low. Once again, when we're talking about visual images, there has to be a specific reference to Afro-Latinx, not dark skin or light skin. So it has to be a specific reference to Afro-Latinx. And I'd like to highlight that in Conversaciones Escritas, there is a reading on the Afro-Latinidad Afro that majority of the textbooks did not actually include. Um, so the implications of this is that there's obvious erasure of Blackness and Afro-Latinx, right? So this very much parallels the hegemonic relations in society and all the racial issues happening in society today. And in addition, there's colorism, right, promoting this notion that the educational materials, there's this binary division of race based on the previous colonization by highlighting light-skinned elite and also famous individuals rather than, you know, the layman individuals in these communities of color. So now we would just like to highlight some of the uh, practical implications and what to do for the classroom. So Lily will take it over from here. Thank you. So now we want to talk about the need for educators to self-educate because it's very normal right now as an educator to ask questions like, so where do I start from? I'm not Afro-Latinx. Um, I don't know much about Afro-Latinx. Um, I'm not Black or any, and it's normal to, all these questions are valid about where you should start from as an educator. But what is not valid is just completely ignoring the fact that we have race and inequality in the classroom. That's something that cannot be overlooked because overlooking erasure in the classroom in itself is a message. Overlooking Afro-Latinx population is sending out a message to students and um, our society as well. So the only way that we can integrate Afro-Latinx representation in our classrooms is if we ourselves, we begin with educating ourselves. And that's the first step before we can even begin with our students. So here we have some resources that educators can use to self-educate. So there are numerous resources, so many books, but these are just a few books that we take. So we have, for example, Down These Main Streets. Um, this book was published in 1967. So we can see that this um, issue of Afro-Latinx representation didn't start now. It's, it's been there for a long time. And this book touches on questions surrounding racial democracy in Puerto Rican culture. 
and it's a good starting point to understanding how um, Afro Latinx are raised and how this is not a new phenomenon. Afro Latinas and Latin Latin Negras is a recent book that was published just last year, and in this book, the um, numerous authors who talk about intersectionality and the fact that um, Afro Latinx uh, misrepresentation or erasure has to do with so many different factors that um, cons that continuously marginalize this group. And so it looks at hegemonic discourses present in Afro Latinida and how to overcome this using an intersectional approach. Another book that we recommend is the African American and Latinx History of the United States by Paul Ortiz. This book also is contains bottom up history, and then it's we have different points of views of different Latinx and African Americans in the US and how people of the diaspora continuously try to address issues of race in the US. The Afro-Latin reader is also a very excellent resource. It has history, it has music, it has gender, class, media, and all these are just examples of the few resources that educators can use to self-educate before we move to the platform. Now, in addition to books, we have um, other readers. For example, Afro-Latino, a deeply rooted identity among US Hispanics. This website has so many resources about the population, about statistics, about several studies that have been conducted, interviewing various Afro-Latinx in the US. We also have this book, Racial Innocence, Unmasking Latino Anti-Black Bias, which is excellent to read. Because in this book, we find out how, um, how Afro-Latinx tend to be, um, we, we, we see how Afro-Latinx tend to be marginalized even among Latinos. And the fact that it's very common to think that because one is a minority, one would not marginalize another minority. So these are questions that are addressed in these books. There are numerous podcasts that also exist. For example, Dialogues in Afro Latinidad, La Carolina's podcast, Majestad Creator podcast. There are numerous podcasts that if you are not, um, don't read, you have the audio option. So there's no excuse not to self-educate because there's so much research that's available. Now in the classroom, there are numerous ways of incorporating Afro Latinidad. And we are starting with history. Okay because it's very important to avoid historical neglect. Silencing the historical connection between slavery and current racial discrimination is a way that we continuously marginalize Afro Latinos. Not talking about, numerous textbooks have sections about history and it's many times we talk about culture in the classroom, but ignoring this connection between slavery and what's happening now marginalizes Afro Latinos because it's all interconnected. It's important to delve into um, historical facts and see how this history has shaped our present culture. And here I would like to mention this quote that by Chino Achiwe that says that, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So this is just to re-echo the fact that history is not just history, it's important, an important way to shape the knowledge that we have now, and it will help us to move forward to uh, make visible a group that is continuously made invisible. And this, ap this applies to all marginalized groups whose history is continuously erased in textbooks. Another way to incorporate Afro-Latinx voices in the classroom is memoirs. Now, the good thing about memoirs is that they allow the reader to get the perspective of the one who is writing through their, the, the person's perspective. You know? And there are numerous memoirs that students may not be able to read all, of course, but like except um, some of these books, it's good to have different authors being incorporated into the readings. Um, for example, we have Black Hebrew and Black American by Evita Grio, Letters to My Mother, Down These Streets. Except of these memoirs are important in giving a voice to Afro Latinx in the classroom. Um, what's the next slide? Reflections are also a good source. This YouTube um, link here about Cuban rules, Bronx stories is something that students would enjoy listening to. It's very educative. 
Um, their videos are highlight the historical journey of the Afro-Cuban from Jamaica to Cuba. No? Students get to get first-hand perspective um, through these stories. Um, it presents the realities of Black Cubans living in the Bronx. It gives an opportunity to talk about identity and invisibility. By incorporating these reflections, we can talk about so many issues in the classroom that go beyond what we see in the textbooks. Students can also compare the concept of race in the United States to the fluidity of race in Latin American countries and see how these affect Afro Latinos. Because in the US, we, um, in the US, in the Latin American countries, we don't have the black white dichotomy that we have in the US. Um, once race has to do with so many different factors, how light the shade is, and each one goes with a certain status. So looking at the concept of race in the US and comparing it to Latin America is also a good starting point to understand how these differences affect Afro Latinos. Students can reflect on even the naming conventions and their implications. What does Latinx mean if you use Latinx versus using Latina or using Latina or Afro Latinx? What do all these different concepts mean in the classroom? These are good discussion points. Um, they can be even they can start even even with their different um, terms or names that we use for minority groups. They all have implications. And so reflecting on these through writing assignments, through group discussions um, are important in the classroom to bring visibility to this group. It's also important to look at how minority groups, how the intersections play between the sexuality, gender, race, ethnicity. How do all these affect these concepts that we have? Um, <clears throat> so as a language class, you may be wondering, so how do you incorporate this in um, the classroom? Vocabulary activities, um, depending on the level. Sometimes it's important to have these readings in English because um, depending on the level, at every point there should there would be a way to incorporate Afro-Latinx. Um, if it's an advanced class, it could be in Spanish. If it's Spanish or any language, um, any other language, but if it's a beginner's class, these readings could be in English. They could look at vocabulary activities that would help to stimulate these discussions. Reflections on the words of songs, for example, how is blackness seen in music? Um, from which point of view, how is blackness conceptualized? What does what the intended message of many of these songs that talk about blackness? Um, songs written by um, Afro Latinx, songs written by African Americans. How, in general, is blackness seen in music? These are reflections that could be brought into the classroom and can stimulate discussions on Afro Latinx. Now here on Netflix, we have the Black and Latino Proud, which is, um, this, so this is free. Most students have Netflix, Netflix. And so this is also a resource that can be uh, used in class or students themselves can watch to self-educate. It's also important to re-echo Afro Latinx presence through linguistics, especially when we are teaching language classes, because there are remnants of African languages in various Spanish dialects. And Many of these African languages have lasting impacts on Spanish. So, for example, a way to incorporate Afro Latinx will be looking at words that are related to food. For example, we have the yams, we have the malango. Students will be able to see that um, Afro Latinx culture still has, Afro Latinx have contributed a lot to, um, to the Spanish language in general, in merengue, in musical instruments, in so many common words. Um, these words can be introduced to students so they can see the roots and then how we can use language to re-echo the presence. There are, there's research on several lexical items that are directly related to African languages. And African languages still have an important role in the Spanish language. Um, for example, in the formation of Creole languages, we have the Papiamento spoken in Aruba and the Palanquero Creoles spoken in Palenque in San Basilio in Colombia. Many students <coughs> do not know about Creole languages and the lasting impact of slavery on these languages. Um, the formation of pidgin languages, um, Afro-Cuban pidgins, Afro-Portuguese pidgins, um, sociolinguistic interviews. You know? um, these are ways to introduce um, and bring the presence of Afro-Latinx through linguistics. And this goes beyond the textbooks because hardly would you see 
in all these textbooks that we examined, we hardly saw any of them even talking about language and um, how the presence, African presence can be found in Spanish or absolutely nothing. By using linguistics, we can re-echo Afro-Latinx presence in the classroom. Um, I just want to highlight, oh, sorry, Lily. I just want to highlight that students nowadays do have the desire and want to talk about these things. For example, in the class I just gave this semester, the cultural presentations, I told students to, you know, think critically, don't present about El Dia de los Muertos or La Piñata, but rather think about what's going on in the world and what's going on in the Spanish speaking world. And one student did a presentation on the caste system and discussed colorism and how it's connected to the realities of he living here in the Houston, Texas. So students do have the desire and do want to talk about these things in a classroom where you create a community and discuss this, right? Um, in, addition, in addition, we'd like to highlight some online resources. These are three websites that I know Flavia and Jocelyn will share this presentation. Um, I just want to speak about the first one that is bolded. Um, this is a task-based open access Spanish language curriculum um, formed by Uju Anya, Melissa Bartley, Eris Clemens, and others at Florida International University. And it centers on Blackness in Latin America and Black language and the Black language learners. It's free for all to use. Um, and it was created based on what those individuals at those universities saw in their students, right? So the community at large. For example, in South Florida, there's um, Florida Memorial University, which is the only HBCU in South Florida, and then Florida International University as well, which is the largest HSI university. So this resource, this OER, was based on the needs and on the population that they saw at those universities. So it's very useful, very helpful, and has wonderful things in there for the classroom. Um, so based on all we've talked about, it is very important that all of us act as social agents to bring change to this mar marginalization, harassment, discrimination of Afro-Latinx and Blacks, but not only in textbooks and when we're teaching, but also in society. And I want to highlight that all that we just spoke about is very much pertinent to other minoritized groups, such as the indigenous Latinx, Asian Latinx, disabled, enabled Latinx. So all this can be implemented to bring a voice to the other marginalized individuals that form, you know, the Spanish speaking world. So as I just mentioned in the prior slide, the Open Educational Resources for Div uh, Diversity and Inclusion by Bartlett, Clemens, Anya, and Gomez. And one thing also is the importance of teacher training in today's diverse world. I know for a fact that once you know you start teaching and it's your first semester, your first year, you might not be accustomed. So you do rely on what is in the textbook to help you guide your teaching. And you might not be you know, quick to think on your feet about how you're teaching and what you're saying. So I think teacher training is also very important to start bringing these discussions on diversity and the inclusion and representing all the speakers who form the Hispanophone world. So we urge the educators to examine the history, right? So what is causing this invisibility of Afro-Latinx and talk about it, right? As Lily mentioned, self-educate, talk about it, because then we'll be better equipped to create a safe classroom, a visible classroom, a diverse classroom, and acknowledge this, you know, diversity that exists in the world language curricula and also in the education sector. Um, so with that, we thank you. Um, and I know that there was going to be a discussion. Flavia, how do you want to go about the discussion? Uh, I think that we can divide in group of four or five, and then there are two questions. So maybe tackle one question per group, and maybe we can come back and, and share some, some ideas. I know that I have a question for you guys. So. Mm -hmm. So Lily and I do have two discussion questions that we were, you know, brainstorming. So the first one is, what are other ideas and techniques you all use in the classroom when teaching about underrepresented groups? And what strategies do you use when explaining the reasons for underrepresentation erasure of these groups? So Afro-Latinx, Asian Latinx, Indigenous. So I'll go ahead and do a breakout room in 10 minutes, and then we'll have questions. Or how do you want to do it, Flavia? I think I, I see I can create a brick of them of four and then everyone. Well, I'm, I'm creating it now, but 
nine breakout rooms, five to six participants. Is that good, Flavia? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, perfect. So now we'd like to open the floor for um, the ideas and techniques that you discuss in the groups. Anyone want to share? Well, I, I'll share a little bit. Uh, we, it always gets good towards the last 45 seconds of the breakout room, but um, we were sharing about when we're looking for resources, how we want to find resources that will educate us about a people from a standpoint of liberty and resilience, because we already know the story about the trauma and the oppression that Afro-descendant people went through, uh, indigenous people. We are we're very much aware of that, unfortunately. And so uh, we're always looking for resources that are, are always gonna be from a standpoint of liberty, resilience, contributions to society that makes life rich, you know, um, contributions to community. And then, so we talked about that. And then also with uh, Women's History Month, when that took place in March, um, I did like a little slide where I was looking for, you know, Afro descendants that were in leadership like the uh, vice president of Costa Rica, the first black woman. And then we have the vice president of Colombia, you know, the first black woman. And then there was a young lady. She's not Latino, but she is Afro descendant and German. And she's like very young, about 25 or 27. And she served a role in government in Germany. And so just kind of seeing ourselves, you know, in those positions, and I feel like that would help draw, because if you notice when you're looking at your students, you don't see too many students studying world languages that are Afro-descendant because we don't see us in those positions. So if we can see us out there doing those great things because we're nowhere out there, we just don't know where to look. If we can see us in the, you know, in those positions, you know, making those contributions to society, I think we would see more. Afro descendants taking these world languages because, you know, we need that. That's how we can build those communities and make those connections. I just want to thank, thank you. you so much for that comment. You really just brought up a point as to why I decided to work on this. I position myself, I'm a white middle class Czech heritage speaker, parents are immigrants, but I was teaching at the University of Central Florida. And as you imagine, there's a lot of people from the Caribbean who are. Afro descendants, and I was teaching a conversation class, and my student asked me, Professor, where am I? Why am I not in this book? Why am I like in my Spanish one class? It's just slaves being talked about, but why are we not talking about, you know, Afro? So I want to be this ally, and I encourage everybody to be this ally, not with Afro Latinx, with all minoritized, minoritized. So thank you very much for that comment. I I really that was. That was good. Thank you. Another thing that we in our in our room that we discuss is about how you know, um, in both in both cultures, in American culture here in this United States culture and our own culture, we practically um, put the Afro Latins in la, in the they're either sport people or. Um, entertainers, you know, but we never put them in an academic level or, uh, or, or, or any other kind of, you know, um, how can I say, um, mass, eh, en, en otra posición donde tengan más, eh, más poder, okay? Um, aparte del deporte y el, y, y, mm -hmm. y el mundo del entretenimiento. Um, Yo vivo en una zona que es el, 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 el estudiantado es de un 60% de afroamericanos. Y, y para poder conectarme con ellos, yo presenté un, el equipo nacional de Ecuador. Y por supuesto, el equipo nacional de Ecuador en el dos, en, para el mundial de, de Alemania se, se, estaba compuesto de negros, todos ellos negros. La primera pregunta que me hicieron, yo enseño, al, enseño a todos los niveles, el nivel más bajo, me, me preguntaron si Ecuador estaba en África. Y, y eso me despertó. La, la, eh, ¿Cómo que dice? Me, me puso, me, eh, I was 
y, y made me aware uh -huh. cuán, desconect, eh, cuán desconectados estaban los, los, eh, eh, los, afro, los afroamericanos. O sea, no tenían esa conexión con el idioma porque no se veían representados en, el, en, en, en nuestro idioma. You see, yeah, what he said is exactly hit the nail right on the head because in our studies, that's something we also found in the books that every time, firstly, they are not in the books, and every time you see them, it's either someone in entertainment or someone in sports based on just stereotypes, just stereotypes that are being propagated. No one in authority, or if the person is in authority, it has to do with entertainment. So, just It's, it's really a disconnect between what is there. That's why we don't have the students. That's why um, our students don't know anything about this group because their books continue to propagate these stereotypes. And it's now our responsibility to go beyond it and open all possibilities and uh, let this get out, you know, because it's really true what you're saying. And might I add also is it, it would be nice to just be seeing regular everyday people just mm -hmm. living our regular lives, regular schmegglers, you know, the struggles, the ups and downs, dating, bills, stress, all that, you know, we experience all that. So just see us as regular everyday people because we see it in real life, but we need to see it represented as we tell our stories, you know, we share stories with one another. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, I was going to share that, um, in fact, last year, um, I um, I used a lot of screenshots from the textbook in my um, beginning level class because I like to kind of repeat what they did for homework and we look at it. And so I would do a lot of screenshots. And last year, I had an epiphany. I was like, wow. They are all this really light brown in the textbook, all of them, every single one of them. And so last year, um, I took it as like one of my jobs and not to change the course content, but to change um, the pictures for real people um, and make it look more like what my classroom looks like in terms of diversity. Um, there was no one with a disability in the textbook for that you could see. There was no one that was darker than Marco, really. There was nobody darker than you. They were all white, Latino, very, you know. And so I was like, this just doesn't even look like them. And how are they ever going to know? Um, in my advanced classes, we use a lot of reggaeton because we talk about stigmatization of Caribbean dialects. And I say, well, how are you going to stigmatize them? Si aprecias tanto su música. Well, hmm, let's see what's going on here. There's a little hypocrisy. So, but in I realized that in my beginning classes, where I was really playing into the light looking Latino kind of stereotype, even in the music that I had given them. And so I, I took a look at that last year and um, changed out some of the songs that I used um, and featured more Celia Cruz, Gran Combo. Um, it's not too fast for them they can there's a lot of valuable grammar in those even for beginning students and when we did uh, no hago mas nada with gran combo we got to even talk about uh how people are sometimes empowered when they play with the stereotypes that are placed upon them and it was a wonderful cultural conversation even in spanish one In English, obviously, we had to do that part in English, but they were able to do the reflexive verb part in Spanish from the song. And um, yeah, I think like the textbooks that were given give us a lot of um, homogeneity. And um, I think sometimes it's our job to not use those photos and not use the recommendations and find things that look more like the students in our class. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. What you mentioned is very true. Lily and I also looked at, and we meticulously counted all the individuals in all the textbooks, dark skin versus light skinned. And it was obvious the light skinned elite. There was more in all the textbooks. So. Or the other notion, the other concept that they get is that it's either light brown, white brown, uh, sorry, light brown, a uh, white Latinos or indigenous people, but they, they never get 
the uh, that we also have Afro Afro Latinos. You know, like for them, it was a shock to see uh, the for the, as, and particularly in this class with these uh, students. You know, it was a shock for them to see that oh, you have black people in there. Yes, we do. You know that we do. So it was good for, as I said before, it was good for them that they have that we have you know all races also in our in our in Latin American countries, and um, we start you know just looking at them and I and I could see that we have I have a good response like from them from my from my from my students you know to let them know that hey you are here too you know you're represented here. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I would like to share um, in your research, you mentioned uh, Kim Potosky's textbook for the second edition. Um, I'm not sure if you have seen the, the latest edition, the edition three that just came out in 2023. I'm actually using that this semester. I'm very happy to hear or to see the changes that were done in this textbook uh, to represent um, Latinx or a very diverse, um, not only in the pictures, but also in the readings. So I definitely would encourage you to, to look at the, the textbook as well. The reason we did not include that in that paper is because the analysis and the data collection analysis and submission was all completed before the book came out. So we did not have access to it. However, I have reviewed it and my colleague, Dr. Edna Velasquez, uses it in our 3371 Advanced Conversation Composition course. It's fabulous. It's very good. And there's a chapter on La Raza and a full on reading of Afro Latinidad. So, yes, it's awesome. Thank you. Roberto also mentioned about a good movie that I'm interested in. I'm definitely going to check it out. He's, uh, he mentioned La Negrada. <laughs> Yes, La Negrada was uh, came out in Mexico in 2018, uh, and it talks about um, black Mexicans um, in in um, Costa Chica, so in Oaxaca, um, and it talks about one of the images that I it is very um, uh, that I remember closely is uh, um, uh, an individual being told, "Go go back to your country." Um, and, and that one is probably one of the scenes I remember, especially because she's talking about her family, her grandparents and everybody uh, growing up in Mexico and they're still being seen as immigrants um, in, in Mexico. So La, La Negrada, and I'll type it in the chat so everybody can see it, but it came out in uh, 2018. It's about an hour and 44 minutes long. Um, I think it's fairly well done, uh, but I think I encourage you to, to watch it. Thank you. I see two hands up, Anne and Claudine. We have, we have time for two more questions. We have Anne and also Claudine. Sure, I, I'll go if that's OK. Um, I just wanted to say I shared in our breakout room um, a little bit about a unit I had done on Afro-Latinidad that I teach um, you know, of heritage speakers of Spanish for the second year. Um, I'm out in California. Um, and I actually, starting with the end in mind, the summative assessment was I had wrote a letter, designed a letter as if I, you know, were an editor of a textbook. And I asked my students' opinions for, you know, we, we kind of looked at that issue of there was not enough representation. And we looked at um, the historical record because a lot of my students didn't know, sadly, um, you know, why so many, um, you know, La, La Trata Transatlantica, what happened, why Brazil, why um, these other countries, um, and then the United States. Uh, and then um, we looked at um, poetry, music, um, uh, literature, and uh, tried to get uh, a lot of different representation in there. And so in the end, they had quite a, a range of things to choose from. Uh, you know, making choices for what they wanted to see in the textbook. And I had them say specifically, like what aspects historical or, or contemporary challenges that they thought should be represented. One in particular we looked at even during the pandemic was like how the, in Mexico the census was, did not have, um, you know, a, 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 a place for Afro-Mexicanos to identify. 
Um, and just kind of looking at that, you know, what, why, why was that? Why is that? What, how are things changing? What movements are happening? I know that Tenoch Huerta has a book out too, wanted to just recommend, it may not be appropriate for all <laughs> levels, um, but maybe there could be some, you know, samples or text or information. He has really strong examples of um, some of the issues. But I just want to say that students, like the, I've heard this mentioned here, have so many opinions, they're very engaged. And that was a really interesting way, you know, maybe someday those textbooks will exist as more students start thinking about what they wanna see represented as well. And I'm happy to share anything. Someone asked me in my, my group if I would share and I'd be happy to do that as well. And we have Claudine as well. Um, I can um, hi, uh, I shared in, in the group I was in that I am in a, in a little bit of a privileged situation because I teach uh, native speakers uh, Spanish language arts. So I do have a little bit of a privileged situation in that sense. However, they are almost 100% ignorant of all of our backgrounds in Latino America or any Afro Latinos, Asian Latinos and that. So that is how I start my day every day. In my school district, we have a focus of a particular group of people every month. So I, instead of saying Native Americans, I say Native Americans in Latino America. You know, if uh, Arab Americans, I do Arab Latinos, Afro Latinos for African American, that kind of stuff. That's how I change it. Um, in February, we do write Afro Latino biographies, so they do have to actually write biographies. And I do not do. I'm one of those teachers that will not focus on uh, singers and sportsmen. <laughs> um, so yes, we do Victoria Santa Cruz. We do Nicolas Guillén. These are people that if they were in their country of origin, they would have actually studied. So I truly believe they should have at least a smattering knowledge of it. Um, I do usually kick off the entire unit though with uh, Me Llamaron Negra from Victoria Santa Cruz. Uh, the for those of you who are not familiar, she is, a, or she was a wonderful Peruvian uh, poet. Um, it's very powerful because then after that, I play a video from YouTube of this little seven-year-old girl actually reciting this poem. And they're usually in tears afterwards and they'll go, oh my God, like, and this, this will get them talking about what discrimination is, what stereotypes are. But I, I, I as I said in my group, it is a lot of work and I, once you start it, you can't, you're addicted to it. You can't stop it. Um, <laughs> but I also think it's very necessary because I come from the point of privilege that I grew up in Costa Rica, that I lived my life in Costa Rica. I came to the United States as an adult. So yes, I landed in the States as a 26 year old, having grown up in Costa Rica and knowing a lot of these things. They don't, they're sitting in front of me and that's my job. At least that's my way of looking at it. <laughs> And please, um, thank you, Rosie and Lily. Fantastic. Uh, many ideas to think and many ideas to be sharing with everyone. And I hope that everyone can come back to the video recording. We will post it probably next week and the slides as well. And of course, if you want to share resources, ideas, things that you're working on now, uh, please go to our CAFE. It's our um, posting board in the text website. And it would be wonderful to see you uh, there. Keep, keep the conversation going. Thank you. And feel free to email us. Our emails are right here. We thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you again, guys. Everyone have a wonderful day. Hope to see you in San Antonio.